Hi guys and welcome to Chat and Chill. I'm Emma. I'm taking over today as your host. Today we have a special guest. Her name is Kat. Not only is she my friend, she was also a two-time pageant queen winner, a blogger, a mum, a debt collector, <laughs> um, a dance teacher. Anything else? Hard work. Model. Model. Woo. Yeah, that's about it really. Yeah. We did a long list of things. Yeah, that's about it. That's who I am. Hi. <laughs> so just tell us a bit about yourself and how like you got into pageants or modelling, where you first started. Um, the first thing I really did in the industry is I tried out for Miss Curvature UK. Mm -hmm. um, which is a modelling competition for curvy girls over a size 12. And I entered that, didn't even think anything of it. I wanted it because wanted to go into it because they were offering like a body confidence workshop. And I thought, well, I'm lacking confidence, why don't I see what I can do? Never actually wanted to win. And they have like this, this thing where you can go in and, and audition to be part of the competition. Yeah. Like you can just do the, the confidence workshop, but you can also do the, the audition as well. So it was like 20 quid, so I thought, why not? Gave him my money, did the audition, didn't get through. But <laughs> <laughs> so it's fine, I didn't either. No, but I didn't expect to, to be honest, because I, I was such a lame ass excuse for a model. Um, that I didn't actually think that I was good enough. And I had no self confidence at that point. And then it happened like in I think it that was in November, I think Box Day, I got a phone call from Theo, um, the man behind and he was like, hi Kat, you really impressed us, um, how would you like to be an ambassador for Mr. Matrix UK? Mm. And I kind of jumped at the chance because I thought, well, if I can't model, um, I would love to try and help people yeah. and see if I can change people's perception yeah, yeah, yeah. of what a model should look like. Mm. So let me see what I can do with this. So yeah. I threw my heart and soul into that and I met a whole heap of other girls that were also appointed ambassadors. Mm. And um, those girls kind of become really close to me, it's where I met other people, and mm. it kind of snowballed from there, really. Do you know what? I actually want to go into like, the whole modelling scene, because obviously that's what obviously you both did the same for me. But uh, what I'm trying to understand is, like, when people talk about models like back in the day, it was very much like size zero, size one, size two, mm. maybe up to size six and then below. Um, what's, what made you want to go into like your scene, of, you know, the whole body positivity scene? Like what made you think, okay, cool, because you, you had low self-esteem and all that, that stuff. So what made you want to say, listen, this is what I need to do. Um, people need to see that you can love yourself. And like, what, what's the inspiration behind all that? Well, what inspired me to want to model was more the case of I didn't see people like me wearing clothes. And obviously, mm. we all need clothes, right? Mm. Nobody needs to see what I did with this. So yeah. clothes are the way forward. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I was like, well, if I want to buy something, I want to see what it looks like yeah. on somebody who is more akin to my shape and size. And there's yeah. nothing wrong with being a size zero model or a you know size two, size whatever model. Yeah. But I can't relate to somebody who is a lot smaller than me mm. um, because I can't see how that garment will actually look on me. Yeah. And I find it hard to envision that when I'm looking at somebody who's a lot slimmer than me. Yeah, yeah, so I wanted so. to see what it would look like on other people and I was yeah. like well I've you know I've got an option here I can try and do it so mm. I did. Yeah, and also what I want to ask you as well because it's very interesting because when you go into like a lot of like these shops like top shop etc etc I mean they'll have an XL but it's not really XL like <laughs> guy I'll be struggling I'll be struggling sometimes yeah. I'm walking in there I say XL and I call try on I'm like hey this is a bit tight for an XL <laughs> <laughs> what is that in the male world though what's an XL like chest size what sort of size is it like a full the entire no, thing, the really. The entire thing, really. Our, our sizes are very just like small, medium, large, XL, XXL. I, I feel, for, I feel for men, yeah, because you guys are all different shapes, just like women are, and yeah. there's not really enough male plus size yeah, garments yeah, yeah. out there. So 100%. you know, like it, men come in all shapes and sizes. Just this like year's the only the third year that I've actually seen that like, plus size line when we went to Curve Fashion yeah. Festival. You've got Boohoo, mm -hmm. yeah, 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 and there's Bad yeah. Rhino, which is. Yours, clothing's and, sister, um, and Jack Jack Bone, yeah, Jack Bone, yeah, Jack Bone, so yeah, well. ASOS is yeah. Well. So it's just yeah. suddenly, yeah. I mean, there always has been like I think it's like big and tall or something. Yeah. I can't remember what it is, but there's yeah. a there is a brand because yeah. my brother's a plus size as well, and he and he's quite tall, so he always used to go and buy garments. There it used to be a shop in Croydon actually, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, I used to go there and buy his Christmas present from there. Yeah. <laughs> but that was it. That was the only thing that would cater for people that are not normal size yeah, so yeah, yeah. you know 
know, it's um, it's hard and it is yeah, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. it's tough. But like, yeah, we go, you know, going into a normal shop and seeing an XL, you're just like, you're pretty guaranteed that that XL is like a probably a fourteen to sixteen yeah, yeah, yeah. expected at yeah. a push. At a push, yeah. Top shop, I don't go in anymore because they don't. Right. Every time I go in, they don't have sixteen on the rack. I have to ask for it. So I just, really? like, yeah, I just don't want to go in there. And then I see jeans. I remember seeing jeans that I really like, black slip ones. Mm. And then I got to the sixteen at the back. I think yeah. it was the only one left, and the slits are different. They've only got one. So they, they don't want all, all this on show. Oh, What's wrong okay. with my knees? Yeah. <laughs> so I just don't go there anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, we need to talk to you, Kat. Uh-oh. Let's go into Brit School, <laughs> do my research. He's been looking you up. Do music, <laughs> sing at weddings. Do. What's your inspiration behind doing music and stuff like that? I come from a really musical family, to be honest. Yeah. My mum is a choir mistress of a choir, in uh, a church choir. Um, my brother and my dad are both musicians and I just grew up around yeah. music um, yeah. you know when your mum is a choir mistress and she's home there, so heavily devoted to the church you spend all of your waking life at church and yeah. you have no choice but to sing. <laughs> <laughs> like sing or just go in the corner and sit there and don't talk to anyone yeah. Um, but yeah that's it was my life and yeah, yeah. I have done I, I've sung at weddings and funerals and bar mitzvahs and all kinds of stuff um, from a very very young age yeah. and then it just kind of felt natural to sort of go into performing arts when I got to college. Is it something that you're looking to do like career-wise, maybe go into music at some point, or is that something you're not really looking into? Um, I think that this is going to sound crazy. For all the confidence that I have, I'm not confident singing anymore. I feel really? like I don't have what it takes yeah. to be the next rising star. And I know I can hold a note, I know I can sing, but whether or not I have the pizzazz to be yeah, like yeah. I just don't think that's me, but yeah. I will never stop singing. Yeah. Um, I would love to go back into doing something musical, um, yeah. but it's not something that I'm focusing on right now. Maybe I'm. Okay. Maybe if we we we're, we're toying with the idea of putting together a little girl group. Oh, so, like a like a party group. Like a little little group of like queenies doing a little bit of singing and dancing. Yeah, yeah, you lot should have a soundtrack. Um, I think it'll be because obviously. What I think like people need to understand is obviously you lot do promote a lot of positivity in terms of who you are as people and yep. um, we're all equal and all that kind of stuff. And I think a song would be perfect for that. I mean, you lot can come up with an EP, you know, it's an inspirational song. Like proper powerful, yeah. like inspiring. At the end of the day, girls rule the world, like, <laughs> there won't be no me but female, let's be real. So, <laughs> <laughs> like... <laughs> no, I get what you're saying. I think yeah. what, there's, there's very few artists that broach into the subject of positivity because it is yeah. such a, it's like mm. quite a grey area. And yeah, it's quite yeah, You don't yeah. want to offend people and you don't want to, like, not offend people. And, you know, there's, there's certain, certain songs out there which you think, oh, this is a really good body positive song and then you have that yeah. one line and you're like, why did you say that? Because <laughs> now you're not positive, positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's just it's, it's it's hard work. You just want to find that balance to find something that's empowering yeah, yeah, yeah. enough to for people to relate to it and think, yeah, I like this song, and it yeah. has to be catchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Do you know I have to ask this question? What? Hold on. Oh, <laughs> he's done that twice though. Me too. Yeah, three basic <laughs> maths. <laughs> <laughs> what would you class as body positivity? Because I think what the confusion is is where does exercise start and where does exercise end? Because you'll hear people, you I see people on Instagram, I've heard you ever before as well, that are like size ten, but on their thing it says I'm body positive. It doesn't have a size. So it doesn't. It's have sizeless. A size. Body positive right. is being confident in your whatever, own skin. yeah, whatever, your own skin, whatever. whatever body shape you are. Yeah. And I think there are certain people within the plus size world who would like to make body positivity wholly about being plus size but it's yeah. not and okay. it needs to be an all-inclusive community right. because everybody has to feel confident in their body yeah. and that's the exclusive thing for plus size people it is for yeah. all people so yeah i don't okay. think there is a start and a finish size so we need to go back to 2015 now when you won um this British beauty curve yeah. Yeah. i have to start there i don't even know where you started in the first place <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you get onto that and um, like, how did it make you feel when you won at the same time? How did I get onto it? I found it on Twitter, like literally I was 
picked them through Twitter and yeah. saw Mish Bridby had come up and they were like, are you a size 14? Do you, are you interested in mute badge? I was like, yeah, why not? So I applied. Yeah. I did not in any way, shape or form expect to even get accepted. Mm -hmm. And then to hear that I got accepted was like a complete change in, in my perception of what I could actually do with my life. Like yeah, maybe yeah, I could yeah. actually... Maybe I could do this, and I never thought throughout the run-up that I had even had a chance of winning. Yeah. So I think if you watch my videos of when I won that year, <laughs> it was quite funny. I was a blubbering mess. <laughs> like, um, it, it was quite a, a powerful feeling to know that I've never really won anything in my life. Like, right, yeah. you know, I've, I've been successful in certain things. Like obviously, like you said, getting into Brit School, there were forty odd people that applied, and yeah. they only took eight people in that year, and I was like, one of them. So I, I've, I've accepted that I am able to you know, be successful, yeah, but yeah. I'd never won anything for myself. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. getting up on that stage, striking my stuff and actually getting a crown at the end of it was like, it was quite empowering. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't think I was going to win it. And obviously after you won, mm -hmm. a lot of opportunities came, came, obviously came forward towards you. Yeah. Um, explain some of the things that you did when you didn't win. So what was like the first six months like for you after you did the first six months, oh God, it's a long time ago now. The first six months, I think I basically spent a lot of time promoting the pageant, yeah. um, reaching out to women, uh, talking to people that I met on the streets. I would literally walk up to somebody and be like, hey, you pretty. And they'd be like, you crazy. Um, <laughs> but it, to me, that is what I, you've done it too. We've all done it. We basically, we love seeing people's perceptions of their own like self mm. and image change. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, the girls that I've, I've spoken to and brought into the pageant, I've seen them like their confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. It, yeah. it's amazing to see it. It's really it's a really nice feeling yeah. to know that you physically changed somebody's life and that's yeah. all I wanted when I started. I, I wanted to make a difference. And yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I feel like a lot of pageant girls that's what they want. They want doing this not because they want to be pretty or beautiful mm. or they're not objectifying yeah. the women. Yeah. They are literally just trying to make a difference in the world. Yeah. Whatever their platform is, they're just trying to make a difference, and you know, you know that's what I did. So I, I went out and did like public speaking. I did body confidence talks. Um, I went back to Miss Cavacious and did like some mentoring with them, yeah, yeah, yeah. with with the prospective ca um, contestants. I, you know, I went and uh, did a lot of charity work and a lot of charity events because mm -hmm. I think that's important in giving back yeah, uh, to your community. Yeah. Took part in a lot of local events, like within my community and my um, like my local area, just to yeah. kind of just to show that yes it is a pageant and they have a certain that people have a certain expectation when you say pageant yeah, and yeah. Um, so I just wanted to prove that we are real people and we, you know we're here to to do something good in the world. No, that's good like, I really do appreciate that we have people well like you two especially that do like things very actually differently because I think in today's world in today's day and age it's all about like it's either you have a big ass or what well, basically a fake ass fake titties and and that's about it really. That's what like, you see on the Instagram, isn't it? So <laughs> it's always refreshing when you get like people trying to do something different and something that would actually call positive. Um, obviously nothing nothing against people that do, you know, do surgery or something, there's nothing wrong with it. I just think <laughs> that shouldn't be so glamorized sometimes, you know what I mean? That's just my opinion though. Um, and I think it's good that we've got people like you that can make people maybe people at home that are like very not confident and you know can't maybe do what other people can do with money and it's really good that we have people out here that are like promoting you know just love yourself for who you are and you don't have to go and get surgery to get this and you know you can still have a successful lifestyle no matter where you're from who you are what your name is what your size is and yeah that's beautiful that's beautiful yeah. to see and on that note um we're going to go to a break uh before the next topic and also, if you do want to speak to Kat or even Emma about anything to do with body positivity, if you really want to get a crown and all of that stuff, <laughs> links in the description. If you do get the crown, remember just say you got it from Sharif and Chill. But we'll see you after the break. Um, see you in like two minutes. So, peace. What up and welcome to the news. And I hope you're enjoying the short tour with Kat and Henry. Uh, let's get into the news for today. Now let's start with Meat Mill, sentences two to four years for violating his probation. Now, um, basically, he has been doing things he shouldn't have been doing, i.e. fighting at the airport. And 
doing wheelies in a state he's not even meant to be at. Um, a lot of people did assume that, you know, he was going to get a couple of warnings and get away with it, but no, no. Nah, it's not what happened, mate. They are saying, nope, we want to give you a jail sentence. Um, usually, you probably wouldn't do the four years, probably end up doing two years, probably not even that, maybe like a year, and that's some house arrest or something like that, I'll put him on tag. You know, he's got money, you can pay his way through, whatever. Um, but yeah, do you think Mingo decides to go to prison? If he does go to prison, what do you think that's what happened to his career? Um, I mean, in terms of where he has been, um, I think he's been at the pinnacle. He's now slowly like going down a little bit. I mean, only going to jail is only going to make his career worse. Um, so hopefully he uh, stays safe and yeah, don't break the law, I guess. Into the next news, Sky threatens to shut down Sky News if news channel proves to be an obstacle in uh, Rupert, uh, Rupert Murdoch's 21st Century Fox bid. Now, basically, you're trying to merge with 21st uh, Century Fox. So you can't merge together or if there's a hiccup with Sky News, he will just shut it down. Now, Sky have came out and said it's a last resort situation. If they can't sort out a bid with 21st Century Fox um, due to Sky News, then they'll try and find another buyer for the news channel. If they can't find another buyer, then news is gone. I mean, if you want to get the best news, you are where you at right now. Chat and chill. Holla at your boy. Thursday, Friday, you get me. Soon I'll be doing it daily. So you don't worry about Sky right now. We'll catch you on Chat and Chill every week. For the next news, NHS say we want our Brexit cash boost. Now, if you do remember, when the whole EU referendum was going down, they were saying, look, we are spending 350 million a week on the EU. This money could be used for something better, like the NHS. Now, the NHS are now demanding, yo, I mean, we've been out of the EU for a little minute now. You know what I'm saying? Brexit is taking its, you know what I'm saying, its toll right now. Where the money at, dog? Where the money at, dog? Where's our money at, dog? You know, with the whole waiting system worsening, nurses don't want to fly to the EU. Not enough doctors to look after these people, then they're like, yo, where's the money at? So I think they need to hurry up, get this money in check, um, and start helping the, helping the community, bro. Like, come on. The NHS is a, is a great, great thing that we have here in the UK. It's free services. Um, but you've got to give the workers less stress. Um, especially the doctors as well. Just give them less stress, make things easier for them. I mean, if one of your arguments were, listen, we spend so much money within the EU and we're going to, you know, put this money now into NHS, a lot of the people out here would have been voting for that, especially if you're a patient that's always like, well, you know, waiting six hours to be seen for a cancer real, forget six hours, I'm talking 10 years just to be seen, you know, if you're a cancer patient or just trying to get an operation for eight years. You get me? So, Definitely something that needs to be worked on ASAP. I do hope um, whoever's in charge of that money sorts it out ASAP. Theresa May, what are you saying? Give me a ring room. We can dial up and do some negotiation deals. Um, I mean, I don't know. Are you spending on offshore tax savings too? Bruh, let me know. But yeah, let's sort out the NHS. Let's get the team working together. And bruh, so let's wait. Please, please. Let's wait in. Anyway, let's go into the uh, next story of the day and most stressful jobs in Britain. Now, there's been a survey taken by the UK and, you know, a lot of these sort of stress stressful jobs in the UK are dominated by women. Now, it says 61% of females are more likely to suffer depression and anxiety. And a lot of these jobs that are deemed stressful are therefore dominated by uh, a female in general. Now, I've got some facts and figures out here on my phone. So, nursing and midwives, you've got teaching, welfare professionals, legal professional, business research, and admin. And it's crazy when you look at the, when you look at the, when you look at the, the amount of females, you've got 88.6% uh, in the nursing, you know, in teaching, you've got 80%. It's, it's almost crazy. Legal professional, okay, 36%, usually a lot more male in the legal department. But the big problem is, and I think the big issue is, a lot of these workers are suffering from depression and anxiety. And um, I, think, I think sometimes people kind of forget females are human. Like we all call them superheroes. Uh, we all know they can work endlessly. They can multitask, sometimes even triple task. 
Uh, females are very powerful, but we do need to come up with a way where we don't overstress people in general. I mean, yes, 61%, you know, are females, but you know, the other 39%, you know what I'm saying, are the mandem as well. Um, again, if you're talking nursing, it kind of comes back to the NHS conversation. We need to uh, find a way to make your job less stressful for who you, uh, who you employ. I mean, now, luckily for you guys, I have nursing experience. We worked at a dental practice when I was doing a course. Uh, so I know how stressful it can be. I actually quit after eight months. That's how annoying it was. I didn't even finish the course. That's how dead it was. Um, yeah, and I've been a teaching assistant as well. Quit that after like seven, eight months again. Stressful as well. And I was just a teaching assistant. So, right, I don't want to teach us like, um, I don't know. Depression and stuff is very difficult, but you know, in very high demanding jobs, it's very difficult to sort of like get the, uh, the, the amount of rest that you need. I think a lot of people don't get the rest they need, the breaks they need, and it's something that maybe should be worked on. Um, but anyway, let's go into the next story. And for this next story, um, hopefully I can cut a little bit of it before I get into it, but it's to do with a lady. Now there was this girl, right, she had a baby, uh, she attacked her baby, dropped on the floor head first, you know what I'm saying, the baby had head damages and all of that stuff and so basically she dropped the infant on the head, shook him while at support unit, the baby suffered extensive head damage and bleeding in the brain and eyes but listen, listen she didn't get judged, now listen, the judge said um, Crosby, which was her name is Miss Crosby, accepted she would acted recklessly and had some good in her now, lawyers know she had once been enrolled on college um, animal welfare courses, which claimed that it showed that, you know, she has some kind and, you know, calm hearted in her and desire to help others. And, you know, she only got a community servant and 18 months suspended. No, come on, man. Are you for real, dog? Eight months suspended. Oh, come on, man. Community servants. What, she's sweeping the carpet a little bit. You get me? Not even that, nah, because, you know, they don't even get to do that because of female, uh, male-dominated uh, community service. She went working in Oxfam. Listen, I don't want to go into race on this topic at all. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even about that lifestyle. It's just not really something that <clears throat> I think I want to talk about in terms of, you know, whether race is coming into this. But I do believe if it was like a black man or an Asian man, you know what's up, at least a year in prison. You know, there was another incident with another girl, I think she robbed uh, Louis Vuitton bags and stuff like that, but because she went to Oxford, she got away with it, because, you know, they can see that she's a smart individual. Now, listen, the next time I hear stuff like that, boy, you better, listen, people out here getting put in jail for, for selling weed. She hurt a human being, three-month-old human being. I mean... Should I paint myself white? But anyways, uh, that's the end of the news. Mm -hmm. Hope you enjoyed the news. Comment in the section below what you think of the news. Um, and let me know, bruh. Let me know what you think of the news. And let's get back to the show with Cat Henry. We good. Hope you guys enjoyed the news. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. And also, if I didn't miss some stuff that happened during the week, you know what to do. You shout me in the comment section. Let me know what I should have been talking about or what I shouldn't have been talking about. You think it was that bad? I'm sorry. But do let me know in the comment section below what you think about all the stuff that went down. But anyways, let's get into our first topic of the day with Kat. Now, if you did watch the news and not skip it, like a lot of people do tend to do these days, um, I did speak on a story on basically the most stressful jobs um, in Britain. Uh, so I'll start by saying the most stressful jobs in Britain which are teaching, uh, you know, admin jobs, researching jobs, legal jobs or legal professional jobs, you want to say. Um, obviously nursing was in there, childcare was in there, uh, fairly dominated by women as well. Um, if you look at legal, uh, legal professionals, there was about 31% women that worked in there, but then from all the other jobs in terms of nursing, teaching, um, what's called childcare and all of that, it was over 80% dominated by females. Now there's a story that came out and basically stated that 61% uh, of females are either suffering from um, anxiety or depression. Now I guess what the conversation in this story is, is basically about 
whether uh, that's an issue being a woman and whether or how you can sort of like fix that problem. There is a way to fix that problem. Like what? What is it that makes people depressed or have anxiety in the first place? It's a problem for everyone. <coughs> it's not just women. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. It's it's such a for so many years it's been such a taboo that people didn't want to talk about it. And I think that now the most important thing is the fact that people are talking about it and yeah, we're talking. Yeah. We're trying to end the stigma about mental health being a problem. Yeah. It's not a problem. It's common. It's common in the majority of people. Your stats are, are right. They are. You know, it's probably higher if yeah. anything because the majority of people that go through anxiety and depression on a day to day basis and there is no there's no cure no. there's no 100%. there's no magic formula that will take it away or, yeah. or make it less and there's no real reason as to you know the start of it it yeah. happens people are wired differently everyone is mm -hmm. different so their triggers will be different and yeah. it's so important I think that people do understand that it is a real thing it's yeah. not there's been so much lost time where people just bypass it and say oh you know you're crazy i mean yeah. what is that that is not that's not a thing like you know people yeah. have real issues and they need to talk about them and yeah. like i said they're triggered by different things yeah so, like different life experiences like people you know you lose your job or you have a breakup or yeah. you lose a family member it's triggered by lots of different things yeah, yeah. i was actually going to say do you think the problem is that females are less likely to quit their job because i was looking at some stats and Men are easily, I mean, I, I worked in teaching, I've, I actually worked in dental practice as well. I quit after six months. As soon as I thought, I just ain't for me, I'm gone. And the stats show that females are more likely to just stay and like kind of fire it up. Is that probably why you guys have a higher depression rate in those type of areas? Because I'm thinking, if, if it's too much for you, why not just quit? Like, even even look at Coxy, when he had, went through a situation in Argo, he just quit. Whereas, I know a lot of girls that tell me I'm depressed, da 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 da, da but they ain't quitting the job that's making them go through that situation, do you know what I mean? Might not have the option, so they might have the, their rent to pay, they might be a single mum. Yeah. You, you, so, you know, you don't have a choice. Yeah. Like, I didn't like my, I liked my previous job, and then I got moved site. Mm. I, as much as I wanted to quit, I couldn't yeah. have a mortgage to pay, so yeah, I had yeah, to go. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it was an escape, that I'd have fun and I'd enjoy it, yeah. and other days I'd get anxiety about the thought of having to get up, and I knew when I woke up and I knew I didn't like my job anymore, that's yeah. when I had to change it, because I thought, what is the point of me getting up every day yeah, to yeah, do yeah. something that I don't want to do, and yeah. I'm going to be miserable over, but I had to have a backup plan. Yeah. I'm very fortunate I yeah. had the option to leave. Yeah. So, yeah. But I agree, there, there's a lot of people in, in society that don't feel like there is a way out, no. there isn't yeah. a way to just leave like if i think about it now it's like i could if i wanted to probably take a back step reduce my hours at work and then concentrate more on the things that i love doing because yeah, i do yeah. believe in job satisfaction has to be your number one priority <coughs> you have to yeah. be happy in doing what you're doing yeah you know just waking up in the morning and realizing you don't want to go into work today yeah. is the start of your decline it's yeah. a, you know yeah. that, that's not the that is a real thing to be like in a position where you think i don't i'm not happy anymore yeah and that's when you have to kind of look at your own personal situation and think, how can I change this? And yeah. some people have the tools in their mental toolbox to be able to figure out and rationalise a way mm -hmm. how to sense. fix it. But yeah. the one killer thing about anxiety and depression is you don't actually have the tools to rationalise. Yeah. And in the, in the circumstances of people that I know personally that have anxiety and depression, they, what is something so simple, so for example, a washing machine breaking down. Now, you as rational people, what would you say if the washing machine broke down? I oh, was so pissed. You'd be pissed off, yeah, <laughs> yeah. but what do you do about it? Just get someone, get get someone, to, you get someone to fix it, yeah. you get someone to, to, to buy you a new one, yeah. or buy a new one yourself. People, the, the one person that I'm talking about in the circumstance couldn't rationalise that. Yeah. It was the end of the world, and it was something that to people that don't suffer from anxiety and depression, they can rationalise the situation, they yeah. can find a fix, find a solution. Absolutely. For someone who suffers, that is the problem that is now weighing on them to the point that they can't function. Yeah, Everything yeah, yeah. is now, the world is crumbling. Yeah, and yeah. you know, there are varying you know, degrees of this. Like some people don't feel that, some people do, but yeah. it's just an example of how debilitating it can be. Yeah, like it's, yeah, yeah. it's a real thing. Like, I think know, as well, as if you're working for a company, that you know aren't supportive and you know that you can't bring it up with. You know, are you? Well, there is like a, a <coughs> government, it's not just a government incentive, but there is an incentive at the moment for a lot of, com like um, a lot of corporate companies have to be mindful of people's mental health. Yeah. Um, 
and promote wellness and that is mindfulness as well as wellness and physical wellness yeah. and they have to take into consideration that people's mental health is something that is just as important oh, and relevant as somebody breaking their leg you know mm -hmm. you need to take time <coughs> to rebuild your own strength yeah. and that is body and mind so. yeah because i was thinking like do these work like in the working environment or in jobs that you have do you even think they do enough to take care of their employees because not from no not for not not enough but it's different yeah. and it's 10 times more than it was say five years ago, ten yeah. years ago. So yeah. it's improving, but it's got a long way to go, and it's not, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, it's never ever going to change overnight. It's a long stage development, and yeah, you need to yeah, yeah. be conscious of the fact that people's opinions do change yeah, 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 all yeah. the time. So that goes really ongoing thing. Right, okay, now what? Two minutes. Just <laughs> <laughs> you used to do it differently last time. Now it's one, two, one, two. Like. What? I'm just saying there's two minutes. Um, yeah. Um, talk, you know what? Talking of like depression and anxiety, um, do you think that it starts from home rather than, or do you think it starts from a working environment? Because I don't know if I'm like, I'm saying it's just, I'm just, I don't know if I suffer from depression because I've got like diagnosed with it, but I suffer from something. Um, yeah, it has to be diagnosed though. I, no, you no, know, but I mean, I'm diagnosed and I know, I know that I've had it and I know yeah. mine at least more, mine started off as anxiety, mine just started at home, mine was from university, okay. and mine was stress, I used to get really bad anxiety to go into a classroom because I knew I was going to be put on the spot and I didn't want to embarrass myself and get it wrong mm -hmm. and then when I flew to America for my second year I was ill out there and I had really bad anxiety, I used to get ice cream headaches, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it was really bad and I, I got so nervous that I something was going to happen to me because I was on my own. And I'd get it, and I, I wouldn't even yeah. think, like, I wouldn't sit there for like hours and think about it, and I knew it was coming on, it could happen at any moment. Yeah, yeah, so I'd be exactly. driving, and I'd have to, nobody knew, yeah. and I'd have to drive and think, right, okay, breathe. And I got really nervous about getting in a car. So when I, even when I come back, I was nervous about driving, just because I thought something might happen. Yeah. And it took me a while to sort of do little things that would help me, like my breathing and stuff like that. And now it's not as bad, there's certain situations where I know. And then obviously I finished uni and I wasn't working for a year because I hurt my back. Yeah. So I was indoors for nearly nine to ten months, and yeah. that's and I was four, I was looking at four walls every day, mm -hmm. and I couldn't have any money, and yeah. that's when mine when I realised mine. Mm. No, I don't. Yeah. I don't think it has. Like I said before, I don't think there's a specific trigger. I don't think you could turn around and say starts at home or starts at work. Yeah. It starts wherever it starts, and it's different for everyone. Yeah, based on, uh, I mean, I guess I'll conclude it. To conclude, uh, there's no limitations to what you go through at work. Um, I would say if you are going through depression or any sort of anxiety, just try to talk to your manager, really. I think that's the most important thing. Um, if he doesn't do anything about it, just quit. Um, I'm sorry. Like, if your manager can't support you and you're not even getting paid, like, a very good amount of money that makes you really want to stay, like, bro, if you're in Sainsbury's and he's like, nah, I don't care about your anxiety, just bounce, you know what I'm saying? Um, every little helps, go to Tesco. Go to Tesco! Yeah, every little helps, let's get some Tesco oh. stuff out. Oh, waiting. <laughs> <laughs> you ready? You drag it out too long, bro. I'm sorry, but you drag it out for so long. It was a very good conclusion. But anyway, let's go into another sports break. And we will see you guys with another topic in a second. And yeah, oh, also, don't worry, we've got a little game coming out later as well. So watch out for the game. So we'll see you in a second. <laughs>